So thanks to Homo Technicus, we have uh, solved the issues, and uh, now Herb Hitters is going to give another great talk about uh, the joint paper. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, so much. Much. oh yes, yeah. so I'm going to sit down because then you can see what's on the screen. Um, please stop me if you have questions as we go along, because otherwise I'll go right to the end and uh, you'll never get any questions. Okay. Um, so I want to talk. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby page down. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Dirk and I wrote. This is based on a paper Dirk and I wrote. Yes. Uh, I think right now, if that's a problem, you'll see me think. <laughs> Homo socialis, an analytical core for sociological theory, and I'm going to present some of the material, especially the uh, uh, most elementary material. Um, and the paper, I'm not going to go into details of why, it's going to be published with lots of comments and a, re and a rejoinder uh, in Review of Behavioral Economics. It should be in a sociology journal, but then we wouldn't have been able to get comments on it. So. Now, this is my clean pen, as they say in Greek. Uh, I found this in a review of a sociology handbook of analytical sociology. I found it last night when I wrote it about 10 years ago or so. Once upon a time, sociological theory was not an oxymoron. There were Weber and Durkheim and Simmel and Cooley and me. There was Parsons who began to pull together a magnificent edifice that foreshadowed the articulation of sociology, of psychology, and economics. But all that is gone. And now there is no sociological theory. The smartest sociologists putter around in the methodology. This is an old version. Uh, the only reason sociology remains at all is that there are sociology departments and there are sociological problems. There's no sociological theory. Now, I want to discuss, this is not working very well. Now that's right. OK, this will be OK. Uh, set, there are here six um, topics, three, six, seven topics that I want to discuss that are sections in a core, um, a core for, or six, for, or three, six, seven for sociological theory. In other words, my argument, what I want to do is talk about what do you give first year sociology students in every graduate department, in every school in the world? Just as in physics, you can ask that question and you can meaningfully answer what's a first year course, a first year course of study in physics? It's the same everywhere, pretty much. I mean, you know, they turn around when they do one thing or another. They all teach the same thing and they don't disagree on it. They disagree on lots of things at the edge, cutting edge of science, but they don't. They have a common language that they use to talk to each other. And they have a common set of concepts that they say, right now, we believe these are true. There may be problems, but they are deviations, excursions from these truths. Problems, anomalies, complexities, unsolved problems, they're all excursions from these truths. And that's the way a science works. Without that, you have nothing. You just have a bunch of people running around talking to each other, using different words that they don't understand. There's a lot of miscommunication even here about what words mean. You don't have this, uh, problems of communication um, in economics within itself. Everybody knows what the words mean. It's not, by the way, what everybody else thinks the words mean, but it's what they all know the words mean to them when they talk to each other. So these are, and, and by the way, I'm not putting these out because I think these are the absolute etched in stone answers, but really, it, these are a set of suggestions for what the course should, be look, should look like. And they should be amended, and they should be changed, they should be replaced, etc., through a collective, scientific uh, set of interactions of sociologists. Now, by the way, it's interesting that if we had about 17 or 18 comments from relatively high-powered people to our paper, and only one had anything to say about whether this should be part of a core. No one even thought it was even, and people think it's crazy to talk about a core of sociology. Well, I don't think it's crazy at all. I think sociology wouldn't exist 
sociology exists because it's uh, of the of the feudal nature of the uh, of the uh, academia. You know, you have these little fiefdoms uh, called departments, and uh, they don't have to talk to each other. They don't have to agree at all on even the same things. They can have completely different theories of the same thing. Think of anthropologists and sociologists and economists, etc. And they're happy to go along with their little journals and. Uh, and you learn when you're a graduate student to, to think that everybody else is a jerk. You know, economists think sociologists are bleeding hearts. They couldn't solve a, a, a linear equation in two unknowns. And sociologists think economists are all, you know, CEOs, manqué. You know, they just didn't make it in Kentucky Fried Chicken. So now they're professors of economics. You know. And I can give you similar things for other disciplines. I mean, economists learn that psychologists have mental problems, and they're so concerned with their own psyche that they study this stuff all the time, except those who deal with animals. Then there's no problem with that. But with humans, well, you know, so if, if my dental hygienist tells me my daughter is studying graduate psychology, I say, well, really, how is she doing? <laughs> well, she's manic depressive, but, you know, she's been doing well, you know, because they're all manic depressive. I'm just kidding. This is the way disciplines think about each other. Scientists do not think that way. Scientists think there's one truth, and we should find it, and there are different, different ways of behaving can give you access to different aspects of the truth. And that's what I think. And I think others who believe that can put together a meaningful core <coughs> sociology because sociology has very important things to tell other disciplines. Nobody listens to what sociologists say. Nobody listens to what social psychologists say. Because they don't have a core discipline either. Until economics, what, people don't like the word behavioral economics, and I never use that term. I always say behavioral science or something, or behavioral game theory, because it's not economics, it's everything. But the reason it, it took off and did so well was it, it took the rational actor model, it took game theory, it turned them into a methodology for doing experiments, and it made predictions, and some of them were wrong and some of them were right. And everybody looked up and said, oh, this is now something we can publish in Nature and Science. You know, this is not just um, you know, within discipline accepted methodology. And in fact, what Ernst Fair and others here at Zurich did at first, the like Get Son Get there and others, um, was done earlier and imperfectly by my good friend Toshio Yamagishi and even Eleanor Ostrom. They got those results, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, their, their methodology was not such that you could uniquely interpret the results in any particular way. They weren't, and they didn't use game theory to get those results. So it's only when we get to these analytical tools that the experimental evidence became important, salient, people recognized it. And of course, economists now, if you read an economics journal, they're totally full of all of this stuff about other regarding preferences and emotions, and uh, it's what people do today. <coughs> Very common. So the point is, and, but I'll tell you something they do not do. The notion of, of say, socialization and internalization of norms is simply absent from economics. It's simply absent from biology, uh, or the biology of human behavior. I have had to work really hard to convince people that these are meaningful concepts. Um, and other things from, from sociology, central concepts, like the network nature of minds. That is, they're not individual decision makers. You, your beliefs and your preferences are determined in a network of minds, of people that you relate to in different ways in your life. So decision making is not purely uh, personal, it's seriously interpersonal. Um, and economists certainly don't understand that, but then uh, no one's ever worked that out in an analytical model that they're supposed to understand. I haven't done it yet, Dirk hasn't done it, maybe Dirk did, I don't know, but I haven't seen it. So my, my plea is, let's get these obvious things that are universals of social life. 
And let's get them down there and say, this is what we believe. This is what you, if you study sociology, you learn all of this. And then let's go critique it, you know. Then we need somebody to say, well, this is all the truth. There's no such thing as rational actor. Ah, oh, equilibrium is nothing. Ah, oh, you know. Because what you're doing is you're reacting to a core that we know is real. And you're doing your uh, you know, ethical complex thing on it, which is fine. That's the way you get progress. So this one. So I'm going to develop an analytical core. We're going to we follow standard dynamical systems theory. What does that say? A dynamical system has a set of equilibria, and they're stable or unstable. We study what the equilibria are and the nature of the stability and instability of the systems. There is no dynamical systems theory. It does not proceed this way. No. I mean, there are agent-based models that don't work this way. But they're just experiments. They're not theory. Agent-based models aren't theory. It's just like, you know, you're, you're letting the Markov process run. See what happens. That's all you're doing. And they're very important and interesting and insightful. But wherever there's dynamical systems theory, you have equilibria, you have, you have a system of equations, you have equilibria or absorbing points of the Markov processes, um, absorbing states, and then you have out of equilibrium behavior, and that's what I'm going to say is central to understanding the whole society. I didn't do that. I'm supposed to go one at a time. Okay. Now, the general social equilibrium model is an expansion of general equilibrium model of economic theory. That's what I'm going to argue. Social equilibrium is an expansion of the model of economic equilibrium developed in the 1870s by Valras, perfected by Arrow, De Bru, and others in the 1950s. Um, now, our dynamical principles out of equilibrium treat society as a complex adaptive system. Okay. And by the way, something Dirk said, um, it's not his fault, but in fact, it's, the tr it's not true. The fact is, with simple self-regarding agents, if you have a set of markets and you look at market dynamics, it forms a complex, dynamic, nonlinear system. It's not a simple system. If you study macroeconomics, they make it sound like it's a simple system by saying, well, you have one firm and a representative uh, consumer and there's one good, and you know, if you're a real con I mean, if you are a microeconomist, and you really think that represent that's absurd. No wonder they get such stupid results, the macroeconomists, because their models don't reflect in any way the operation of dynamical, complex, nonlinear systems, and they couldn't possibly, because you can never capture the behavior of such systems in single, closed form analytical models. You can't capture them in Markov processes with huge numbers of states. And then you can simulate them on the computer very nicely the way you can um, weather systems in physics, in the uh, you know, weather forecast. But you can't solve the equations. You can set up the equations, you can't solve them, because there are millions of them. And there are millions of variables. And you're looking for the eigenvector of a matrix that's 10,000 by 10,000. Try it sometime. Um, so what do you do? You use evolutionary game theory. I am going to turn this on now because I don't usually need it. Does this work? You need evolutionary game theory. And you need agent-based Markov models to, yes, thank you if you do that. I should have brought my computer. Um, based, based on variants of the replicator dynamic. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Evolutionary game theory and agent based Markov models based on variants of the replicator dynamic. Thank you. I don't need it now, do I? Okay. Um, now, the inspiration for some, at least the, the uh, equilibrium part of what I'm saying is Calcutt Parsons, who, to my mind, 
along with Weber and uh, Durkheim, were the greatest sociologists of all time. Um, he initiated the formal modeling of modern societies in his 1937 book, The Structure of Social Action. But he abandoned that social action approach in the early 50s. And he moved to functionalism, and structural functionalism, in which um, actors are effects, but they're not causes. In other words, people are socialized to behave in certain ways, and they do what they're told. And if they don't, they're called deviant. You know, you're deviant if you don't do what you're told. Um, but there's no bottom-up theory so, uh, at all, the role of agents in, uh, in structural functionalism. And all structural functionalisms are bad and false. They may be fun. I mean, I love reading Foucault you know, and Luhmann. If I really want to go to sleep, you know, I'll read Luhmann. It takes about three lines of Luhmann, and I'm asleep. But they're wrong, because there's no role for people in those systems. And the correct way of dealing with society and individuals is it's a by it's a movement in both directions, from the structure of society to individual beliefs and preferences, and from individual beliefs and preferences back to the structure of society. Neither alone says anything. Um, Parsons, why did Parsons go in this direction? I've often wondered, why did he give up with action theory? The short answer is he was a bad mathematician. He was really, really bad mathematician. So he couldn't do the rational actor model. He couldn't do game theory if he wanted to. He never learned how to do it. But in addition, there was no real decision theory before 1954. Savage put decision theory on the map as an analytical device in 1954. And we go through this in our paper. And there really was no game theory, certainly not in the 1930s, but even Von Neumann uh, and Morgenstern are very innovative, but until you get the Nash concept, you have, you have no useful uh, game theory. And that's 1950. So game theory really started in the mid-50s. Um, general equilibrium theory, which I'm going to talk about, also really is the mid-50s. So if only Parsons had been born 10 years later, and he had learned a little math rather than spending all his time in the German universities, learning all that, uh, you know, um, Haber, um, not Habermas, he's pretty good. Um, <laughs> all that uh, um, Hegelian stuff. He would have been, I think, he would have done what I'm doing now, a long time ago. Um, okay. Now, one thing, uh, interesting thing Parsons did that sociologists still love to do, is to follow Pareto, who was the great, he, he may be also one of the greatest sociologists of all time. He's, he's extremely powerful. But Pareto, Pareto said there's a strict separation between preferences over economic values, money, wealth, and social, political, and moral values. Because you can't analyze those in the same framework. You must keep them separate. Let the economists do the economic values, let the sociologists do the social, political, and moral values. And Parsons followed that, even though it's completely illogical. It makes no sense whatever in terms of human behavior, because people don't divide their lives into the moral. They, you know, I'm at home, and I'm a good uh, homo socialist, and I take care of my kids, and I go to church, and I pray, and I help, and I go to work. And oh, well, economics, all I care about is make more money. <coughs> Cheap, steal. <coughs> Borrow. Don't pay back. All I care about is money, man. But when I get out of the door, you know, I'm back in homo socialis. <laughs> the whole idea is completely insane because you cannot run an economy with selfish agents. This is a terrible mistake. You cannot run an economy with selfish agents because um, you can't make complete contracts. You can't contract for all interactions. You depend on the goodwill of each other. In, in, in relating with others. I think the Uber thing is a good example. Uber works really well because, pe because people are basically social. What if you gave, uh, what if the driver, Uber driver, just said, well, if you're a female, I'm going to say you were a lousy, pay uh, you were a lousy client and you didn't pay me. 
if you're uh, if you look to be Italian, I'm going to give you a good rating. And what if the uh, what if the client did the same thing? Well, I look at this guy. He's got a beard. I don't like beards. Screw him. I'm going to give him a bad rating. Yes. This is exactly not the way Google works. Oh. There, okay. the price is defined by the company, and the, the driver has no influence on that. So, uh, more economical. So well, then that's even better. If there's no way to tell whether the customer is polite and undangerous, and or, or the the driver is reckless, or etc. At any rate, I, I won't get into details. The point is, you could not run that system unless people had some ba basic pro-social, and certainly that's true of, of Wikipedia, and etc. But I don't think almost any institution where there's interactions among strangers, things ever reduce to uh, homo economicus, ever. But at any rate, we can talk about it. Um, so, you can't separate motives. Um, now, here's the first of the six principles I'm going to go on. Gene culture coevolution. Um, sociologists generally don't like biology. Which is very strange because we're a species. And we're not the only social species. There are a lot of social species. There are many social species. There's a whole book written in 1975 called Sociobiology by E.O. Wilson that the last chapter talks about humans, but the other chapters are all about ants and bees and wasps and corals and uh, naked mole rats and all sorts of other social animals. And social animals are very interesting because they all, every society, social species acts differently. Humans are one social species. And do you think we don't have anything to learn about the, the, the similarities and differences of our social lives from that of others? Of course we have a lot to learn from. Some of the most important things, if you say humans behave this way, well, how did they evolve to behave that way? If they all behave that way, how did that evolve? It's probably genetic or common culture. Um, but probably genetic because it happens everywhere. How did it evolve? And how do other species deal with similar problems if they have them? So gene culture coevolution is a model like this. <coughs> Humans are distinct by having developed cultural forms transmitted across generations. Other species do have culture, meaning things that they learn and they transmit to each other within a generation. But they don't have real ways to transmit it across generations very well, and it tends to disappear at a maximum of two or three generations. Um, so basically, a cu cumulative culture is the only is human, and we're the only species that have cumulative culture. What is culture? Culture is what they call epigenetic transmission of information. All all animals transmit information to the next generation through their genes. They all do that. In addition, some, sometimes animals teach the young things. A few things, not much. But humans have a second whole set of information transfer, cultural transfer. Um, now the interesting thing about cultural transfer is, um, uh, is that once you get culture, that affects genes. Because who has children and who does not have children, who gets killed and who lives, depends on the culture of that society. And so culture affects genes. And that, that interaction back and forth in the evolution of our species, in fact, the hominids, um, is what's called gene culture uh, um, co-evolution. <laughs> Because humans have enjoyed cumulative culture for much of their evolutionary existence, they've evolved complex social structures that serve as the background conditions for future genetic evolution. Individual fitness in humans is the product of the structure of human social life. And, human so and by the way, our ancestors 10,000 years ago and back, as far as we can tell, all lived in hunter-gatherer societies of size of approximately 150 individuals or 10 families. Um, and they did the same things. They all did the same things. They hunted and they gathered and they produced the same tools. For 100,000 years you get the same tools. Um, so they probably lived much alike. There's no evidence of any difference in the way they lived. And that's how we evolved who we are in those societies, who was successful in those societies. Um, 
That's deep culture coalition. So that, that has endowed us with co co cognitive capacities and <coughs> predispositions to adopt culturally fostered personal preferences that go beyond the self self regarding concerns emphasized in traditional economics and biology. We evolved in, in small social groups where sociality and interaction were absolutely central, and they were not boundaries. It's very important to understand that hunter-gatherer societies are genetically very diverse. They're not families. Okay, there are ten, eight to ten unrelated families, or close to zero genetic uh, relationship. This is in contrast to every other social species. Every known social species is, has very high relatedness within the group. There, at least it started out that way. If you get into things like hymenoptera, like bees, a beehive you'll find fairly low uh, genetic relatedness because there's several queens and they made multiple mate and this and that. But they evolved from a situation of very high genetic uh, uh, similarity. But we're not, we're very low. Um, and that creates uh, the need for all sorts of strange very human um, capacities. In particular, we have a social epistemology that facilitates the sharing of intentionality across minds, much more than any other species. That is, we know what you're, I can, by talking to you, I know what you're thinking, I know what you're going to do next, I know what you want. It's called a theory of mind. Um, and it's also, uh, this is responsible for other regarding values, which most in almost every other species, uh, uh, individuals are self-regarding except for kin. It's called kin recognition and kin selection, which is you uh, cooperate with kin and everybody else is the enemy. Or sometimes you have some mutual things you do together, but you don't sacrifice for non-relatives. And that gives us a taste for cooperation, a sense of fairness. <coughs> I wish I had time to get into where fairness comes from. I have an article on this on my website. Uh, with uh, Carl Van Schaik, who's an anthropologist, primatologist, and uh, Christopher Bohm, who works on the gatherer societies, of how fairness evolved um, and why it's important for humans, and it doesn't exist in other creatures except in very elementary forms. Capacity to emphasize character virtues, the idea of honesty, hard work, piety, loyalty, these are character virtues, and we're capable of having them. Other animals have no such behavior. There's no such thing as an honest microbe or something like that, or a monkey. I mean, they, they may tell the truth, but not because they have a concept of honesty and they feel good and they feel morally desire, uh, uh, morally pure if they uh, are, are honest. Uh, and also, we have the ability to intentionally change the rules that govern our social life. And this is not true. And, uh, the, uh, social species all have political structures and social structures, but they're not changed. They don't change through the collective action and forward-lookingness of the agents involved to, to make conditions better for them. Now, so that's gene culture coevolution, and in my view of how all the behavioral sciences fit together, Gene culture coevolution and biology play the role that physics does in the natural sciences. It's, it's behind everything. And then we branch off from there. So now I'm branching off to something. This is not even beyond uh, gene culture coevolution. The rational actor model can be, can be uh, derived from um, evolutionary principles. Um, you expect agents that behave all to, be, to uh, correspond to the rational actor model. Biologists have no problem with the rational actor model. Even if they're dealing with frogs and bees or microbes, they have no problem with the idea that these agents are maximizing or have transitive preferences and are maximizing <coughs> something subject to their constraints and models. They all accept that. So there's nothing new here. So we model the choice, choice behavior using the rational actor model according to which individuals have a time, state, and social context-dependent preference function over actions, payoffs, and beliefs concerning the probabilistic effects of, the, of their actions or outcomes. So if someone says, well, I don't believe in the rational actor model because people have to change over time. 
Well, give me a break. Come on. That's zero critique. Of course people can change over time. The rational act doesn't depend on a constancy over time. It even doesn't depend on constancy over state. I behave very differently in the men's room than I do in the uh, lunch room. What else is new? Do you have the same preferences in the left in the lunch room as in the men's room? No. Well, that's not you're not rational. You should have the same preference. Okay, let's see how that will work out in practice there. At any rate, now, these critiques are ridiculous. And also, no, I'm going backward. Also, um, preferences must be socially context dependent. They're not absolute. If I'm out in the middle of the rain and I'm looking for a taxi, I'm going to behave differently than if I am in uh, my home and I want to call a taxi. If I'm in China and I want to call a taxi, I'm going to behave differently than if I am in Zurich and I want to call a taxi. These are all state dependent, social context dependent. They're called frames in the uh, empirical literature, in the experimental literature. All social choices are frame dependent. They're social context dependent. So there's no problem with that. Um, and to be rational certainly doesn't mean that you only care about material goods and services. <coughs> That's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with rationality. Rationality means that you have consistent transitive preferences over some choice. <coughs> um, and by the way, some economists will tell you, you can always find economists who say that rationality implies, you know, self-interest. But they're just wrong. I mean, that's just wrong. It's not economic theory that tells you that. Nowhere in economic theory will you find anything where it says rational implies self-interest. Anywhere. Anywhere. Um, what do you include? Well, some actions are, uh, the, the action itself is valued for its own sake, not because it gives you some instrumental end, like consumption. Again, honesty, character virtues. You, you virtually, you value your political action as I described it on Monday. I vote because that's what I do. That's part of my constitution as an individual. Um, I value it for its own sake, not because I think I'm going to change the outcome of the election, which I know I'm not going to change the outcome of the election. Okay, I did that. Um, social actors generally value not only self-regarding payoffs, but also other regarding payoffs. And before I get to that, let me say one thing. I may have written it here, but I was inspired by Dirk's comment about sex. Sex is not rational. Sex is not welfare enhancing sometimes. Right? There's a saying, it's in Yiddish, but I'll translate it into English. When the, pe when the penis rises, the brain sinks into the, re the rear end. <laughs> it's much more interesting than Yiddish. And the idea is people do stupid things. You know, like I read about a guy, he's a professor at Yale of uh, Greek, comparative Greek studies. He spent 20 years getting all the degrees and everything so he could teach at this wonderful institution. And then he puts child pornography on his office computer and gets fired. Well, this was not irrational necessarily, but it certainly wasn't in his self-interest in some, and smoking and other, there are many things that aren't in your self-interest. But nobody ever, the theory of rationality that I'm talking about does not say you do what's good for you. It merely says you do certain things and they're consistent. And in the end, it ends up with an incredibly powerful theory. It has no content. It's like, it's like you know, manifold theory, complex manifold theory, or uh, you know, like in physics, all sorts of um, Hilbert spaces. There's no content to Hilbert space, but if you put a few axioms onto the Hilbert space, you get an incredibly rich and powerful theory. That's what rational actor model is. It's, it's a general mathematical theory that for, works for every set of behaviors that, that conform to a certain set of axioms. It doesn't matter what the goals of the behavior are at all. Just do they conform to these seven axioms, the savage axioms. Um, so there's nothing irrational about caring of, about other people. Other regarding purposes can be perfectly rational. No problem with that. Um, 
The rational choice model expresses, but not, does not explain preferences. Some people think it's, to me, incredible how they can believe this. But they think if you believe in the rational actor model, then you shouldn't study psychology and find out you know, how people really organize their brains. But the rational actor model says zero about your goals. It doesn't say what's in your preferences. It doesn't even say how you get your beliefs. It just says you have them. So in, it would be like in economics if I use a production function, you know, and I say, you get these inputs, you put these in, you get these outputs, and someone says, wait, you, have no, you don't need engineering anymore. I mean, what's the difference what the firm is, you know, because it's just inputs and outputs. So why do we need mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering, and all that stuff? Well, of course, that's ridiculous. <coughs> the fact is that the production function in economics doesn't need all those details. It needs only a couple of things couple of axioms. And similarly, the rational actor model can't tell you anything. It can't tell you anything because it doesn't say anything about what your preferences are, how they change, what your beliefs are. It says a, a lot about how your beliefs change. It's called Bayesian rationality. But, um, and it's mostly true. It's unbelievably powerful in psychology, Bayesian, Bayesian update. But it's not completely true. And also, by the way, human behavior doesn't always satisfy these axioms. For, for 40 years, people have been doing studies showing that there's special cases where they do not satisfy the rational actor axioms. But w what these are really like is like in psychology, when you study visual, uh, what do they call them? Um, trompe uh, uh, Visual uh, paradoxes. It looks like these are two equally straight, li equal straight lines. No, they look like one's bigger than the other, they're really equal. There are all sorts of things where our visual perception misleads us. And there, I can give you a hundred examples of these visual paradoxes. But we do not conclude from that that people don't see right. We don't conclude from that, and we learn a lot about visual processing from that. But in special circumstances, you don't see right. Well, that's true of the rational actor model. It works really well most of the time. But around the edges, like very low probabilities or very large outcome uh, differences, it doesn't work right. We can show that it doesn't work right. Human beings consistently make the same deviations from the, from the rational actor model, from the, the uh, expected utility maximization. But we don't have any better model for them in general. So we use the rational actor model. And by the way, as soon as somebody says, this theory is stupid, it's wrong, I say, well, show me the right theory. Show me the right one. This one seems to do pretty well most of the time, and it makes certain errors or really important errors that we have to correct. But show me the right one. If you can't show me the right one, then you haven't said very much. The only real critique is an alternative. Um, it's like in physics, if you, you know, a lot of physics here. If you say, well, you know, general, level, uh, general uh, relativity is wrong because it conflicts with the standard model. Or the standard model is also wrong because it conflicts with general relativity. Both of those are true. And by the way, both are incompatible with uh, uh, give these no, no time, stress, uh, no preferred time direction. So they're both incompatible with um, uh, thermodynamics. People have known this for 100 years. So we stop using all of that? So what? Just find me something that puts them all together correctly. And that's what we're looking for here. You want to put them together correctly. Um, many economists believe rational choice explains behavior. But they're wrong. That's all I can say. And we know that from, from all these experimental uh, results, that uh, rationality is far broader than anything you might have ever thought it was. I've talked to moral philosophers and told them the, the uh, public goods game and asked them, how do you see this? These are people that work on moral philosophy every day or five days a week, and they've done so for 30 years. And, and then, thank you, then uh, I ask, um, how do people behave in the public goods game with punishment? They never get it right. Never. I've never had one yet get it right. Um, so what's rational and how humans behave, the, 
Humans are rational, but it doesn't tell you anything about how they behave. It's just an analytical apparatus that can be used. Um, all you need for rationality are preference consistency, which means transitivity of preferences, and a couple of other things like no wishful thinking, which I won't go into. People do violate that. No wishful thinking is something like confirmation bias. Uh, you, if, you, if you think something would be wonderful, then you think it's more likely to occur. That screws it up. Oh, that's great. Um, so, so I'm not going to go through the axioms. I don't have time. Um, but they're mostly uh, pretty simple. Um, so I'll leave that out. Now, the next thing is, um, the next principle, major principle, is the social division of labor. I won't go into this detail. All of you who study sociology know this. The notion of social role, which really goes back, uh, it goes back to, to uh, uh, George Herbert Mead, Ralph Linton, Thomas Parsons, and before. Uh, and um, the content of a social role is a set of rights, duties, and expectations, rewards, etc. Um, and an equilibrium, well, that's not important. Um, none of that is important. Role occupants are actors who fill the different roles. And you can think of the relationship between firms and workers. The firm set up the roles for the workers, and the workers occupy the positions that, in, in the firm. The social organization is exactly that, only on a broader scale. There's things other than firms, their families, their hospitals, their government organizations, their NGOs, or all sorts of institutions. They all set up a set of interacting roles, and then they recruit actors to fill those roles. And the actors maximize their utility subject to the constraints, the incentives, etc., and the information that go for the, uh, with those roles, including the moral constraints and preferences. So it's not just material, and that's true in the workplace too. Anybody who says that the relationship between bosses and and workers is purely material, it's just wrong. It almost never comes down to that. There's a moral element, and there are traditional elements, there are informer elements, non-contractual elements. The same thing's true in general. So just take the, the general equilibrium model for economics and replace firms by all social organizations, and replace workers by all actors filling social roles. And then see how they interact. Yeah, yeah but that information on these roles uh, is not perfect, right? It's, uh, Where do you think it is perfect? Uh, nowhere. Nowhere. Okay. So it's no difference. How is it different? I mean, how is it different if you go to work in a new firm? You know a few things about it. You don't know that your guy next to you gets sick every two weeks and gets your kids sick. You don't know your boss is an alcoholic. You don't know hundreds of things. But you know, if they have a vacancy, right? A vacancy. Um, yes. I mean, if, they, if they're looking for somebody to hire, yeah. you, you can learn that. Well, you learn that in, in, for, for all social institutions. Yes, but there's no uh, market that says, oh, I have a, an empty space for a spouse here. Yeah. So well, that's not the way the labor that. markets work either. Yeah. Labor markets don't have, there's no place where you go. Like, when you say, I'm going to the market to buy some meat, there's no, I'm, you can't say, I'm going to the market to sell some labor. There is no market for labor. That's just the, okay, we'll go on. There, if you think about it, you'll see that they're really not different. There's no market for labor. How do you figure it out? You read the newspaper, you talk to friends, you got a lot of job interviews, all sorts of stuff exactly the same way as if you want to work in Africa as a missionary, a medical missionary. Okay, moving on. Um, so according to this model, which I call the social general equilibrium model, the general so Actors are modeled as rational decision makers who fill these roles. And the incentives for the roles can be material and moral and political. But you have to have the incentives. Um, okay. Uh, so that's general social equilibrium. Now, a lot of people are very critical of general equilibrium in economics, and I think almost always wrong. General equilibrium by far. And it's almost right. It's just not right. 
and it needs a lot of additional stuff. And by the way, general, general equilibrium doesn't tell you laissez-faire markets or free markets or something like that. That's not what you learned. When I learned economics 50 years ago, I think, could it be that long? Yeah. I learned from Richard Musgrave public economics about market failures and the whole anatomy of market failures. And that is the most powerful social policy tool that I know of in the world. And it hasn't been supplanted by anything. The only people who criticize economists for social policy, they're not criticizing economic theory. You know, some, some guy gets up, I'm an economist and I believe we should get rid of the Federal Reserve System. These economists are crazy. Um, no, that's not, economists don't believe you should get rid of, uh, get rid of uh, they don't believe in small government, they don't believe in big government. Individually, you believe whatever you please. The theory doesn't tell you anything about the optimal size of government, but it tells you about the principles of when the market will not behave on its own. And is, are we close to general equilibrium? Yes. Every day you go out and you buy the same things at the same prices and you're not surprised. The, you know, the, the butter that you bought for uh, one euro yesterday isn't 17 euros today. And it doesn't look like um, sausage instead of butter. It's the same stuff. Innovation, very simple. Have a rate of innovation. It's called labor-saving innovation, capital-saving innovation. Um, this has been known for years. For, we always know in equilibrium, you have an equilibrium rate of growth. You have an equilibrium rate of innovation. It can change over time. There's nothing wrong with equilibrium. The problem is you're not in it ever. You're always having excursions away from it. And the really interesting point is, when you have an excursion, how far, how far do you go and how long does it take to get back? There's not even a question about stability. In fact, a friend, uh, a colleague of mine and I proved that ge a general stability result for general equilibrium um, a few years ago using um, evolutionary gain theory and uh, uh, population gain theory and the other tools of mathematical economics. So there's no problem with stability. The problem is fragility. That is, economies can either react slowly and carefully to changes, or they can go wildly out of whack before they come back. And that we cannot get that from you know the uh, the um, eigenvalue of a matrix. It's very hard to study stability of dynamical systems, and the only way I know is by simulating. But that's what we have to do, and that's what Dirk was talking about. We have to we have to be able to simulate and um, do better social policy by figuring out how systems are, how fragile they are, and how to lower their fragility. You can't increase the stability of the system. Well, you can, in a sense, make its base and attraction larger. But it's either stable or it's not in that order. Um, but you can change its fragility. OK, so that's general social equilibrium. I'm going to stop. Anyway, um, you know, there's so much here. The, the third major institution is the social psychology, so psychological theory of norms. Now, here, there are kind of called the collective consciousness. But calling them norms, I think, is better, and that's really what Ralph Lytton did in 36. Um, now, the thing about social norms is you can actually analytically model them as Nash equilibrium of social games. But I won't go through the details because I don't have time. I argue, I've argued for years actually, in, in my book, uh, Bounds of Reason, that Nash equilibria have very poor, it's very hard to justify most Nash equilibria. Just because it's Nash doesn't mean the people will behave that way, unless it's pure strategy Nash equilibria, of simple games. But what Social norms are really correlated equilibrium, which is a much more robust concept. I won't go through that, but uh, and by the way, these correlated equilibrium norms are not just—they're they, not obeyed just because people are selfishly following them. They can also require legitimacy, and if people think they're illegitimate, they won't follow. Them. So norms can depend integrally on uh, moral uh, moral principles, and that's true in economics too. I don't have time to go through the beautiful studies that show 
If you try to write a real contract with a, with a firm, between two firms, that specify all of the uh, conditions, you get a lousy contract and people will violate it all of you. Uh, they, they won't, it won't work. Because you can never specify the conditions. You need trust between organizations. And you need, um, people who work in the economy have to have personal dignity and self uh, emotion of righteousness that they use in their behavior. Um, you can't be purely selfish and have an economy work. That's just a, a myth. Okay, next, socialization. Well, also all sociologists know what this is, so I won't go into it. Humans, interestingly enough, not only have preferences, but we have programmable preferences. No animal other than us has really programmable <coughs> preferences. Now, as you can think, two individuals at birth, and they can end up being, if you separate them at birth, they can have totally different behaviors because of the way they're socialized. They'll have some things in common. Uh, a lot of common level of intelligence will be in common. There are a lot of things that people who are genetically identical or close have in common. But they'll speak different languages, they'll have different values, they'll be very different. So this is an important major institution. Of course, there are limits to socialization. One of the mistakes that sociologists make, and Marxists, Marxists have made this from the beginning of time, which is, well, you can socialize anything, anybody into anything. You know, because we're totally flexible. Well, we're not totally flexible. Humans can't be socialized into anything. What channels they can be socialized into are complex, but they're very strictly limited. The Soviet Union, they try to socialize people into being good communists, uh, you know, give according to your ability, uh, take according to your need. They tried it for 50 years, and it didn't work. In fact, nobody ever even believed it for a minute. So, social norms card, I've talked about concluding remarks. Well, I've talked about that, so I won't go into that. That's not even, that's not that important, so I'll do that. Our hope is not that our views will be accepted as whole, but rather the task of setting up such an intellectual exercise and uh, as, as a core um, a core analytical, an analytical core for that discipline uh, should really progress because it's, it's scandalous the way sociology is now. It's not only sociology, by the way. It's not the only field that has this problem. That's what I'm talking about today. Thank you.